And so again, Jesus is the answer. And uh, I think it's important for us to understand that because Christ is enough, even in tough times and dark places. And we're just going to read Colossians chapter 1 and verse uh, 13 to 18. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. You may be seated. You might ask, Pastor John, why do you always get us to stand when we read the Word at the start? Well, I believe it's, it's, it's important for us to give honor to God's word. Amen. And uh, the Bible here talks about how Christ is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so it's my sincere prayer that, you know, this message, by God's grace, you know, that, that God will use it uh, to enable Christ to truly have the preeminence in our lives. Amen. And that today we would give him the honor and the praise that belongs to him as God. You know, it's my prayer that your eyes will be opened to the endless possibilities that exist through faith in Christ, through him who conquered death, hell, and the grave. Uh, again, A.W. Tozer, Christ is enough to have him and nothing else is to be rich beyond measure. To have him, Christ is enough. To have him and nothing else is to be rich beyond measure. So the question is today, do you have Christ in your heart? Then you are rich beyond measure. Amen? And so it's important for us to grasp this because some of you may not have even realized how rich you are. Ephesians 1, 18, uh, Paul prayed, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And so I pray that God will use this message today to open your eyes to what Christ has wrought for every one of us on the cross and to what belongs to us in Christ. John chapter 3 and verse 14. Here Jesus is talking and um, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen. And uh, again, Jesus here was quoting from the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 21. And um, it talks about how the people complained. And uh, it says that uh, serpents came in and started biting the people. And that's why you have to guard yourself against discouragement. The Bible says the people came, became discouraged on the way. And you know, this is the reality. All of us, to one degree of an, or another, are on the way. Um, if you know Jesus is your savior, you're not where you used to be, but uh, you may not be where you want to be, but it's so important we don't get discouraged on the way. Uh, remember, if you're single and you desire to be married, you're on the way. He is on the way. She is on the way. Amen. And um, it's, it's important don't get discouraged because discouragement opens the door to the devil. And we see here the people game discouraged. And uh, even worse, it says they spoke against God and against Moses. Sometimes we can literally talk ourselves out of a miracle. We can talk ourselves out of the very prayers that we have prayed. We can negate those prayers. We can nullify those prayers through the unbelieving words that we are speaking. And uh, the people spoke against the Lord, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned against you, uh, we've sinned, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord uh, that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. 
And uh, that's the heart of a, a, a pastor right there, because uh, sometimes the sheep can bite you, and, but you always got to love them, and, and love them where they're at, and, and by God's grace, bring them to where they need to be. And then uh, the Lord said, uh, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If the serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And so you could say this was the cross on credit. This was uh, a type of Christ because, uh, you know, the Bible says God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's why we don't have a figure of Christ on the cross because when he was on the cross, he was uh, a, a curse. He became a curse right there. He took our sin. He took our bondage. He took our curse so that we could be free. And um, and so essentially what God was saying to the people of Israel is, look and live, amen? And uh, so that's the beauty. God commands us to look and live because to be honest, the current environment uh, seems vaguely uh, familiar. And, um, uh, you know, in some ways it feels a bit like the early days of COVID. When you will walk through the shops, I remember those early days, you would feel the tension in the air. People were silent. Nobody was really talking or chatting. Everybody was on edge. And in the same way today, people are scared. Uh, war, violence, inflation, soaring energy bills, uh, rising uh, interest rates, uh, you know, economic uncertainty. Um, people are afraid, again. And, um, and it's clear this isn't an accident. It's by design because people are much easier to control when they are afraid. And um, no joke, I think it was a week ago, the Sunday Independent one on the front page, um, it said, government needs to give loans uh, to people so they can buy electric vehicles to reduce emissions. I just thought it was verging on farcical because right now people are terrified about not being able to pay their mortgage, heat their home, and feed their kids. And the media is still obsessively pushing this whole climate change agenda. And this is how disconnected the elites are from the everyday realities facing people. You know, the suffering of the masses doesn't concern them because ultimately climate change is a cult. And... um, you know, I think I thank God. You know, I think it was in the Netherlands this week. The minister for agriculture, who is one of these obsessive uh, climate change uh, people, pushing these uh, you know idiotic policies that are going to lead to starvation, and particularly uh, in the developing world, because it's going to reduce the output of food hugely. I mean, the Netherlands is the number two producer of food in the world. I was amazed to discover that. And so these climate change policies were going to cause something in the region of over. 11,000 farms to shut um, in the name of appeasing the climate gods. And, um, uh, uh, but thanks be to God, that man had to resign because of the farmers who, who responded so, so strongly against these measures. And uh, you might say, oh, pastor, you mean you don't care about the climate? Of course I do. I care about the environment. But I don't believe that paying higher taxes reduce, you know, uh, affects the climate. Uh, and, and I certainly don't believe that impoverishing, uh, you know, the, the population is going to somehow um, affect the environment in a positive manner. And so, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> this is the reality. You are the carbon that they are trying to reduce. Uh, it, it may start with the cows, but it's going to end with people. And that's what they don't understand. You know, there's a very sa- famous saying from, uh, I, I, I can't remember, was it, uh, it wasn't Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but, uh, you know, in World War II, first they came for the Jews. Or first they came for the socialists. And, uh, you know, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the, the Jews. Then they came for the, the Catholics. And then they came for me. And there's nobody left to speak up. And, and there's a, a certain degree of, of, of truth to what is being said there. And there's a parallel to our current generation. Um, uh, because it's not about cows. It's about control. And, um, uh, you know, it was very disturbing Uh, yesterday I saw in the UK where these, you know, hundreds of people attacked, you know, this dairy production uh, place where they, you know, they they, they punctured all the tires and they damaged the trucks so that they couldn't take the place. And this is the problem with with this whole ideology. It's not about somebody making a personal choice for themselves. They want to choose for you as well. 
and, and that's a major problem. And so anyway, um, <laughs> let's, let's move on from that. The, the answer in light of all of the craziness that's happening in our world right now, um, the answer isn't found in giving in to frustration, anger, uh, or despair, um, or panic. The answer is found in looking on to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so again, Jesus is the answer. And I think it's important for us to understand that because Christ is enough, even in tough times and dark places. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. Paul the apostle here is talking in the New Living. Are they servants of Christ? Um, I know I sound like a madman. But I've served him far more. I've worked harder, uh, been put in prison more often, been whipped uh, times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 stripes. Uh, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day uh, at sea. I've traveled on uh, many uh, long journeys. I've feared danger. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts and on the seas. And I have found, I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, and I've often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? I must bo if I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am in God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who is worthy of eternal praise knows that I'm not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Aretas kept guards on the city gates to, to catch me. I had to be lowered in a basket through a window in the city uh, to escape from him. You see, clearly, Paul went through some tough times. He was tested in the fires of affliction, but he prevailed. You know why? Because he was convinced that Jesus Christ is enough. He clung to Christ even in difficult times. He was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ is enough. And his, simply, his simple philosophy was this, Christ is enough. Christ is all I want, Christ is all I need. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, all the more gladly I will glorify my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, Paul was in the dark place. He had been persecuted. He had endured a lot of hard things. He'd been criticized. He'd been maligned. He'd been abandoned. He'd been attacked. He'd been thrown in jail. He'd even been shipwrecked. But thankfully, he had learned some things along the way. And that's why why uh, Philippians 4, 11 to 13 says, I, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Um, I, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. And, um, and, and so Paul, Paul understood this. He, he said, I've learned some things along the way. He declared, I can do all things through Christ. You know what he was saying as he was writing this book from a stinking Roman uh, prison cell uh, somewhere in the region of 62 AD, either in Rome or in Ephesus, two or two, three years before he would be uh, tortured and beheaded. He was simply saying, Christ is enough. Amen? And so he was simply saying, they can take my freedom, but they cannot take my joy. And it's important for us to, to, to learn from what he was uh, saying here. Uh, I think it was uh, Tertullian in 210 AD said this, the Christian, even when he is condemned, gives thanks. Hallelujah. The Christian, even when he is condemned, gives thanks. Uh, it was Leonard Ravenhill who said, the early church was married to poverty, uh, prisons, and persecution. Today the church is married to prosperity, uh, personality, and popularity. And you know, the reason why that hurts is to degree it's probably true. Because the question is, why is the church so unwilling in this day and generation uh, to take a stand for truth? 
You know, there's a, a, a man in Mount Joy Prison this week simply because he refused to use uh, 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 pronouns uh, that, you know, that this young child decided they wanted to use. And uh, because he's, uh, it was a, a church school, ironically, uh, a Christian, uh, you know, it was Church of Ireland school, my understanding. And, uh, you know, they've taken an approach that has put that man in jail. And so, again, it's quite disturbing for any of us who, uh, you know, uh, hold to values like freedom of speech and particularly freedom of religion and when you see denominations that are caving into this ideology um, which is completely unbiblical this is the issue uh, God made them male and female that's what the Bible says and if your church doesn't endorse that or stand behind that that is an apostate church or that's a church that's moving in that direction and so again the Bible says hold fast that which you have that no man take your crown this is a day as the church where we have to hold fast to eternal truth. The Bible says, contend for the faith. We have to contend for truth. And uh, again, if you're a woman, you should be contending for the fact that, yes, you are a thing. Okay? Uh, you know, there's such a thing as male and female. And, uh, you know, this, this idea where people are walking around pretending that a male is now a, 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 a female because of the way he is dressed, or, uh, it's ridiculous. Okay, and, and you know, the time may come where I'm put in prison for saying that, but that, that's a fact. Okay, so anyway, uh, Christ is enough, and uh, it's time for the church to change. It's time for a reset. They talk about the great reset, but you know, I believe it's time for a great revival. A revival of truth, amen? A, a revival where we as the church begin to take the word of God seriously. Amen? So I appreciate over the last season, uh, many of you have been tested to the very limits of your patience and sanity. Some of you have lost loved ones, you know, through COVID. Others of you lost jobs, even businesses. Um, in a way, this last season has been one of losses, but I, 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 I take encouragement from John chapter 15, where, where uh, Jesus talked about how the Father prunes. He prunes uh, those branches that they may bear more fruit. We're going to come out of this season, I believe, and we're moving into revival. We're going to see a great turning of people to Christ. Because again, the times are going to be so crazy. I believe the church is the only place you're going to find any sanity or anything that makes sense. Amen. So, like I said, many people, uh, you know, uh, over this last season, it was a season of losses, loss of freedom, loss of opportunity. For some, loss of dignity, even loss of hope. But in spite of this, uh, you know, many of us also lost our fear. Our fear of man and our fear of failure. Amen? Because the Bible says the fear of man is a snare. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1 to 2. And it says, thus says uh, the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. So here the Bible says that God has called us. He has called us. Amen. And therefore, we're not to be afraid. So let, let me say this. Come at the time, come at the man, or come at the woman. Amen. You are here for a reason. You're in this generation. God didn't have you born 50 years ago or 500 years ago. Amen. So, uh, you know, uh, in spite of the pressures and challenges of this age, you know what? There is no age that didn't have challenges or pressures. Amen. And so we must understand, we're not the first generation to face tough times. We won't be the last. Amen. So anyway, God says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. We have that promise that no matter what we're going through, it's not going to harm us. Psalm 105, 17 in the Amplified. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who is sold as a servant. His feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in chains of iron, and his soul entered into the iron. Until his word uh, to his cruel brothers came to pass, the word of the Lord test, tried and tested him. The Bible says his soul entered into the iron, or his soul became one with the iron chains that he was in. Uh, the the Dewey Rames Bible says, iron pierced his soul. 
the Young's Bible, iron hath entered his soul. And so this is a season where God wants to put some iron into your soul. He wants to, to toughen you. He wants you to be strong, amen? He, he, he doesn't want you to be weak, amen? The, the Bible says you're more than a conqueror through Christ who gives you strength, amen? So it's important for us to, to grasp this because the battles we fight along the way are simply used by God to harden us to tests and trials, amen? Because like I said last week, the very thing, the very Great things that Satan sends against you to destroy you can be used by God to develop and define you. Remember, you know, the devil was sent Patrick to Ireland to destroy him, and yet he ended up becoming the patron saint of Ireland, bringing revival to this nation, shaking this nation with the gospel. And 1500 years ago, we still celebrate this man's life. So again, uh, it's important for us to understand that sometimes the pain is simply part of the process. And so Psalm 119 says, verse 17, it was good for me that I was afflicted. You know, some of you went through some very difficult things, but you know, some of you, the devil threw everything against you, including the kitchen sink, but he didn't prevail and you overcame and you became stronger. Glory to God, so bring it on, devil. Think about it. It was Satan who put the three Hebrew children in the fire. Daniel in the lion's den. Jeremiah in the cistern. And Peter in prison. But each time God ended up being glorified by, deliver, by their deliverance. What the enemy meant for your evil, God is going to turn to your good. Could somebody say amen? amen. Some of you might have been addiction, others of you was porn or some other, maybe abuse. But you know what? You've come through that thing and the enemy is a defeated foe and you are a stronger person today in Jesus' name. So this is why, again, we look at the cross and we are reminded that we matter. We're reminded that there is a purpose to our life. We're reminded that God does his deepest work in dark places. We're reminded that God, not man, is the one who has the final word on your life. See, some people have put labels on you in the past. They've limited you. They've, you know, dismissed you. They've criticized or condemned you. But remember something. It is God has the final word on your life in Jesus' name. And this is why, like Micah, chapter 7, verse 8, we can repeat, you know, what he declared there. He said, rejoice not over me, my enemy, for when I fall, yet I will arise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light to me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You see, Christ is enough. Amen. We, we can declare, you know what? I might be down, but I'm not out. Glory to God. I might be knocked down and getting back up again in Jesus' name. So very quickly, his life is enough. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, nobody lived a life like Jesus Christ. He is unparalleled in all of human history. Heralded by angels, born of a virgin, laid in a manger, filled with the Spirit, confirmed by the Father, attested by signs and wonders, amen, uh, crucified on a cross, buried in a tomb, but raised from the dead, witnessed by disciples, and ascended into heaven until he comes again in glory. That's why Acts chapter 1 talks about this same Jesus will so come in like manner as you've seen him ascend into heaven. And that is our hope. Amen. The glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 and 30. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hey, hey, he's coming again. He's coming again. Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming again to this sin-sick, weary, deceived world. He is the answer. Amen. Jesus Christ is the answer. No prince, potentate, philosopher, guru, or king can stand beside him. He alone is king of kings and lord of lords. He alone conquered death, hell, and the grave. 1 Timothy 6.14. Keep this commandment without stain or reproach. Until his appearance, until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the blessed and only sovereign one. The king of kings and lord of lords. 
who will bring about in his own time. He alone is immortal and dwells in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen him, nor can anyone see him. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Jesus Christ is Lord. You know what, what Paul was saying to Timothy? Christ is enough. Could somebody say Christ is enough? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Even the servants of the Pharisees were forced to declare they had never heard anyone like him. John 7, 45 and 46. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. You see, his life is enough. No one loves you like Jesus. Amen. There is no other Savior. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Amen. He is the way. The way where? The way to heaven. The way to peace and forgiveness. The way to intimacy with God. Amen. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Yes, indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have uh, suffered the loss of all things, that I may, and I count them rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, and that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So this was Paul's heart cry, that I may know him. Because his life is enough. Because he loved us enough to die on the cross for our sins. He died that we might live. He never sinned, and yet he did not come to condemn. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. And so in light of his life, in light of his sacrifice, amen, the only appropriate response for us is to serve him with all of our hearts. For, you know, for us to live for his glory and to do his will. Amen. This is so important. Let me read this quote, Pastor Mark Patterson. We're too Christian to enjoy sin and too sinful to enjoy Christ. We've got just enough Jesus to be informed, but not enough to be transformed. Does that describe your life? Does that describe your life? Is that speaking to you this morning? You're too Christian to enjoy sin, but you're too sinful to enjoy Christ. We must give God our very best because it is an insult to him. In light of the cross, it is an insult to him for us to be half-hearted. Why is it after COVID that people are coming to church less than they were before? I find it shocking. Priorities. Jesus Christ is coming again. Put Christ first in your life because his life is enough. The life of Christ has inspired men and women to serve him and to do glorious things in his name. You know, men and women through the ages, his life has inspired them to, to serve with courage and dignity and honor. Think of people like, you know, Mother Teresa, uh, William Wilberforce, Martin Luther King, you know, all of these men, uh, Hudson Taylor, John Newton, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, men and women who, who you know, took the stage of life and, and chose to put Christ first, who chose to serve him because they were convinced that Christ is enough. All of them were inspired by Christ to make this world a better place. Amen. And this is why it's important for us that we put the Lord first because I'm mindful as an Irishman of the bitterness that so many men and women in this nation have carried for generations towards Great Britain. Resentment and hatred Literally visited from father to son. You know, manifesting itself in, in anger, hostility, and sadly, even violence and murder. I remember as a little boy growing up in the 70s and 80s, you know, day after day, hearing on the news of, you know, three Catholics killed, uh, two Protestants killed. You know, and it was just, after a while, it became just, you know, desensitized to it. But it was, it was an awful thing. It was a terrible thing. Men and women, you know, murdering each other in the name of, of religion or some glorious cause. You know, Jeremiah chapter, uh, or sorry, Ezekiel chapter 18 addresses this. It says, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. 
Jeremiah chapter 31, 29 again repeats this sentiment. In those days, they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. We've seen on this island where this kind of thinking has led us to, to where our society is fractured on these age-old lines. And this, this hatred is just perpetuated. You know, generation after generation after generation. But Jesus Christ teaches us a different way. Because this isn't just case in Northern Ireland. This is something you'll see globally. Resentments that are carried on by tribes towards each other or nations or ethnic groups towards each other. And it always eventually manifests itself in, 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 in hatred and violence and murder. But Jesus teaches us a different way. You know, a different way to the endless cycle of, of offense, bitterness, and vengeance. Because we can feed a root of bitterness. The book of Hebrews warns us against permitting a root of bitterness in our hearts. Because we can, we can allow that, we can feed a root of bitterness, or we can follow Christ's example and do something radical. Forgive and forget. We can't live in the past. You know, the men and women who did terrible things, whether in this nation or other nations, they're dead and they've gone to face their judge. But it does not give us a right to perpetuate hatred towards people who have never done anything towards us today. Amen? As Christians, we are called to forgive. We're called to let it go in Jesus' name. And so, we have been given this ministry and this message. The Bible says we've been given a ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 5. Th that is our ministry. It is a ministry of reconciliation. We're called to be peacemakers. Okay, and so that's why it's my hope and prayer that, you know, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for us to obey what the Bible says, you know, to forget the former things, to consider not the things of old. I will do a new thing. God wants to do a new thing in this nation. You know, he wants Catholic and Protestant to live at peace with each other. He wants people from the North and from the Republic to live at peace with each other. You know, God wants us to, to respect each other, irrespective of what nation or what color, what background you're from. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for us to just respect each other and love each other as human beings in Jesus' name? Could somebody say, Amen? amen. And, and this is one of the problems with social media. Social media has given us the ability to amplify every kind of possible grievance and offense and perpetuate it. And so again, let me just say this. If I block you, it doesn't mean that I don't love you. It just simply means I don't have time for your drama. Okay, I'm not going to waste my time arguing and fighting. Amen. I have work to do. Amen. God has given me a job to do, and we're going to see a revival in this nation, but I have to be focused on what God has called me to do in Jesus' name. So firstly, his life is enough. Secondly, his love is enough. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Oh, I love quoting that when I stand on the, pre the street to preach in this city. For God so loved the world. Amen. You may be far from perfect, but know this today. You are loved by God. And it's his love that has kept you back from the, from the edge. It is his love that has drawn you back from those destructive places. You know, many religions will tell you what you need to do. They will give you a code of ethics or morals. They will, they will tell you what the requirements are, so to speak. But Christianity is very different. Because it reveals a God who not only saves you, but one who loves you. Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins. Revelations chapter 1. Jeremiah 31. Truly I've loved you with an everlasting love. The gospel reveals a different kind of savior who demonstrated a different kind of love. You see, nobody loves you like Jesus. Nobody loves you like Jesus. Deuteronomy 31. 32, 31. For their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. See, Christ is enough. There is no one like him. No one loves you like Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or how you have failed. He loves you. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans are good and not for evil to give you hope and a future. This is what God says to you today. You may have failed, but you're not beyond God's grace. You see, grace is calling your name. His grace is greater than your sin. His mercy is greater than your mess. Grace is calling your name today. 
Have you answered? Have you answered that call? Give it to him, whatever it is. Romans 5 and 8, but God shows his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. The NIV, God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ demonstrated his love for us because talk is cheap, but Christ demonstrated his love for us at the cross because it wasn't the nails that held him on that cross. It was his undying, everlasting love for you and for me. Because even when he sees us at our worst, still he he believes the best. He doesn't see you for who you are. He sees you for what you can be. He doesn't see where you've come from. He sees where you are going. And by God's grace, you are going somewhere. You are going somewhere with Jesus. Amen. And so, again, Peter had denied Christ three times. He'd arrogantly promised Jesus that he would, he, you know, he would stand by him even when everybody else would abandon him. But pa- how Peter had failed, he had failed spectacular, spectacularly. He had, he had failed irredeemably and worst of all, publicly. Hmm. There would be no coming back for Peter for where he had fallen but God. You know, as Billy Graham said this, God proved his love on the cross. When Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. You see, the cross, ironically, is a symbol of God's love. To the Jews, 2,000 years ago, it was a symbol of pain. It was a symbol of, of, of defeat. It was, it was a symbol of, of torture. And yet, God, by his grace, turned that symbol into a symbol of hope. A symbol of love, because his life is enough. His love is enough. His love is enough. It was love that held him on that cross. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I look at the cross and I'm reminded that I matter. I look at the cross and I'm reminded that there is no price that love won't pay. Amen. I look at the cross and I'm reminded that there is a purpose for my life. Like I said, he sees us at our worst, but still he believes the best. You see, this is the thing with Peter. He was finished. With what he had done, he was finished. But this is the beautiful thing. A man who was called to preach the gospel of grace was about to be shown grace. And this is why in John chapter 21, Jesus has this interaction with Peter. And that's why I love that verse where Jesus said, tell the disciples and Peter. Because Peter naturally assumed that he was finished, that he was excommunicated, that he could never, you know, be a friend of Christ again. And in verse uh, 15, it says, so they'd eaten breakfast. Peter said to Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. Then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him, he said, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. When you're old, you will stretch out your hands. And another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. I don't know if you remember Matthew chapter 4. Jesus called Peter, said, follow me. And Jesus again emphasizes the call. You know, in a few weeks, hopefully I'm going to talk about the call of God. But here Jesus, you know, reaffirms the fact that he has called Peter. And just like that, he reinstates Peter. Your sins and lawless deeds I'll remember no more, it says in the book of Hebrews 10 and verse 17. His past failures wiped out in just one moment. His relationship, his relationship with Christ made a whole. You see, three times Peter denied Christ and three times Jesus gives him an opportunity to confess him because how many of you know sometimes we face, we, we fail some of the tests of life along the way. I don't know about you. I look at myself and I'm conscious of so many areas I failed, but God is so good. He's so loving. He'll allow you to sit that test again. 
Three times Peter gave the wrong answer and three times Jesus gives him an opportunity to give the right one. He said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. We serve a God of grace. We serve a God of mercy. We serve a God of love. He loves you. His love is greater than your sin. Peter had been tested and failed, but he discovered when we are not enough, Christ is. Christ is enough. And on the day of Pentecost, the very first sermon to be preached was by Peter, and 3,000 people were saved. Not Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Peter. I mean, who would we have picked? Definitely not Peter. I mean, he would have been sent away on some kind of a seven-year rehab or retreat, and he would never have been allowed to speak publicly or lead again. You know, there's denominations that, you know, if a man is, if a minister ends up getting divorced, and I don't in any way endorse divorce, that man is never allowed to speak again. I don't believe that exemplifies the gospel of grace that we preach. If you're married, stay married. Make it work. But you know, we need to give people grace for where they have failed because the Bible says all of us, all of us have failed. All of us have sinned. Peter discovered that even after denying his master that Christ is enough. His life is enough. His love is enough. Psalm 73, my heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Paul said, Peter said in, the, in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, love one another fervently, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Only Peter understood what that really meant. Only Peter understood how much love or the love of Christ had covered in his life. His life is enough. His love is enough. And lastly, his liberty is enough. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty whereby Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I'm going to finish this message. And I rebuke every spirit of sleepiness in this place. Amen. Every unclean devil in this place. I command you to get out of here in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't come to church to sleep. Come to listen. Come to learn. Come to be changed. Amen. We're not here because of tradition. We're not going through the motions. We're here to meet with God. Come on, just pray in tongues for a moment. Come on, I can't hear you. Just pray in the spirit for a moment. Come on, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Come on, stir yourself up for a moment in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, because I'm not near finished. That's pathetic. That's pathetic. If that's how you pray, the devil's going to walk all over you. Come on. Let's hear your voice this morning. Lift your voice in prayer. Come on. Come on. Lift your voice. Come on, Lord. We want to see a move of the Spirit in this nation. Glory to God. And the key to, the key to revival is prayer. We got to learn how to pray. We got to learn how to pray. How to press in prayer. Glory to Jesus. If you're not filled with the Spirit, we're going to give you an opportunity at the end. To be filled with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. It's so powerful. It's so important. In Christ alone, we find liberty from sin and shame. We were sinners subject to the wrath of God, but Christ courageously took our place on the cross. Hell and damnation should have been our portion. But God, Christ suffered the penalty of our sin and set us free. He liberated us from sin and Satan. It's an amazing thing to be set free, to have assurance of your salvation, to know your name is written in the Lamb's book of life for all of eternity. And that's why even as he was taking his final breath, he cried out, Father, forgive them. The cross is a symbol of how we are forgiven because we believe in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You see, liberty and freedom is found in Christ. And sadly, the further our society goes from Christ and his teachings, the the less free and the more autocratic our society will become. We must not take our liberty for granted. Freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought. Many of these have been undermined 
This is why pronouns actually matter, because it's looking to control how you think. It's looking to control how you speak. Amen? And so, again, many of our freedoms were either lost or undermined during COVID. You know, and this is why, again, we see social media censorship, LGBT indoctrination of our children. In Ireland, we have a president who openly speaks of his admiration for socialist dictators. And it really makes you wonder, because socialism doesn't bring freedom. Ask anybody from Venezuela or Cuba or, or China. You know, we, I don't know if you've seen those disturbing videos online of Chinese cities that are in lockdown. Even now, to this day, cities that are in lockdown, buildings that are in lockdown where they have drones outside with a loudspeaker telling people, stay in your home. And sadly, you have Chinese people throwing themselves off buildings. We need to be praying for China. We need to be praying for the nations. Let me say this. Communism is of the devil. It's a demonic uh, ideology that is consistently given the same result of, of destitution, slavery, and poverty. You know, this is the same communist government that Justin Trudeau saw at Mars. He said, you can get so much done. Idiot. <laughs> Sorry. We don't say mankind, we say people kind. Who says people kind? Hands up, anybody here says people. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> but this is the problem. You have leaders like this who have been given a platform because they're serving an agenda. You know, the sad thing is this, is many people will not appreciate liberty and freedom until it is gone. But ultimately, true freedom isn't found in a political ideology or a politician. Freedom is found at the cross. Freedom is found at the cross. And irrespective of how crazy our societies may become in the days to come, we know this, freedom is found at the foot of the cross. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. You see, we are free people. We are free because Christ has set us free. There is a freedom that's only found in Jesus Christ. It was the church father, Justin Mars, Martyr, who said this, you can kill us, but you cannot harm us. Know this, child of God, do not give place to fear, no matter what craziness you see around you. They can kill you, they cannot harm you. You know, John Fox wrote this in Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'd encourage every believer to read it. Polycarp refused to deny Christ, although the proconsul begged him to consider yourself and have pity on your great age. Reproach Christ, and I will release you. Polycarp replied, 86 years I've served him, and he never once wronged me. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Threatened with wild beasts and fire, Polycarp stood his ground. This is a time for us to stand our ground. This is a time for us to stand our ground. To stand on Christ the solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Because true liberty is found in Christ alone. And this is why we must go in his name with his gospel while there is yet time. Amen. Leonard Ravenhill, Christ cared enough for sinners to die for them. Do we care enough for sinners to live to reach them? Leviticus, Leviticus 25 and 10, proclaim liberty throughout the land to the inhabitants thereof. You know, that's carved on the Liberty Bell. A number of years ago, I was in Philadelphia, and I got up early that morning to pray. As I was walking the street, uh, there was a man, a homeless man on the street, and I started sharing the gospel with him, and he received Christ. So I invited him to come with me for breakfast. And so the two of us sat there, and we were just having a chat. And over and over again, this lovely man, he was telling me about his daughter, and then he says, you have to go see the Liberty Bell. I had only uh, a couple of hours, and... I, I always wanted to go to the Rocky Steps there in Philadelphia. I wanted to go up there. <laughs> Asia! You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Kerry. I stood on top of a mountain. I went, Joanna! And nobody got it. They were like, why are you shouting your wife's name? I said, oh, man. <sighs> I've seen that movie over and over and over again since I was a little kid. Uh, amazing God put me in a boxing stadium. <laughs> 
But I went to see the Liberty Bell and carved, you know, engraved on that bell is Leviticus 25 and verse 10. Proclaim liberty throughout the land. You see, liberty is found in Christ. And the further a nation goes from Christ, even America with all of its great, tremendous spiritual legacy, if America continues to go away from Christ, it's going to become no different from any of the other socialist nations, you know, marred by violence and poverty. I pray for America today in the name of Jesus. I pray for godly government. I pray for change. I pray for a revival. I pray for awakening in the United States of America in the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, blow on those coals in Jesus' name. Blow on that nation, Lord God, and all of the nations in Jesus' name. Revelation 21 and 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be, and death shall be no more. And there should be no more mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And so we must press through the storm because Christ is enough. No matter what we face and no matter where we fail, Christ is enough. His love is enough. His life is enough. His liberty is enough. Amen. You know, I feel a great sense of, of, of gratitude for the British and, and American and Canadian servicemen who stormed the, the beaches of Normandy 70 odd years ago. You know, their courage and their valor convicts me as a man. It convicts me. Because it's, it's a sobering reminder that freedom is not free. All of us were handed freedom, but we must not assume that that liberty and freedom will be handed to our children if we refuse to stand up and speak up. We must count the cost of following Christ. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And so as I finish today, I want us to take a moment to consider the price that others paid all because they were convinced that Christ is enough. Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword in Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree in Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil, and yet he escaped death in a miraculous manner and was afterwards banished to Patmos. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome because he deemed himself unworthy to die in the same manner as his Savior. James the Greater was beheaded at Jerusalem. James the Less was thrown from a lofty pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death with a fuller's club. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was bound on an X-shaped cross from which he preached to his persecutors for two days before he died. He gave his final sermon from a cross and it was two days long. Thomas was run through his body with a lance at uh, Cormandel in the East Indies. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas of the Gentiles was stoned, stoned to death at Salonica. Paul, after various tortures and persecutions, was at length beheaded in Rome by the Emperor Nero. Timothy, he was an 80-year-old bishop in Ephesus. And any of us who have been encouraged by the book of Timothy, where Paul writes to him and encourages him to, to fight the good fight of faith, you know, to, to stand, you know he, he encouraged Timothy as a young believer. And here, Timothy at 80 years of age, they were having a, a procession um, to celebrate uh, Diana of the Ephesians. And as they did, he stood in their way and started preaching the gospel to him. And the pagans were so enraged, they beat him and then they stoned him to death uh, in, in Ephesus. You know, each of these men courageously gave their lives because they were convinced that Christ is enough. The question is, are we? Christ died for us so that we could live for him. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. There's a freedom you only discover when you surrender your life completely to Jesus Christ. So I'm not asking, have you prayed a prayer? Or were you baptized? But I'm asking... Do you, do you live for Jesus? Do you serve him? Do you believe that Christ is enough? I must work the works of him that sent me while it was day. The night cometh when no man can work. It's clear when we look around us that the light in our society is fading. 
You know, it's obvious we're living on borrowed time because sin and all sorts of perversion and confusion have gripped our society. You know, even our government institutions are, are you know, the corporate world, you know, uh, even the educational institutions have all sold themselves out to these radical ideas, unbiblical ideas like socialism and LGBT. I mean, in the UK, it came out there, they spent over 17,000 painting, you know, a few fire trucks in the rainbow colors. Because how many of you know when your house is on fire, it's great to know that your fire truck is diverse. Celebrates diversity. Police, instead of actually, you know, uh, capturing criminals, virtue signaling their, their, their uh, beliefs at gay parades. And while this is the world, we must live like Jesus Christ is Lord. Night cometh when no man can work. There is such a thing as too late. And there are so many who are not ready for eternity. This is why we must be about our father's business and his business is souls. So we must redeem the time and ask God for nations. He said in Psalm 2, ask me, I'll give you nations. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world and then the end will come. We don't focus on the signs. We focus on doing what we're called to do, which is bringing the gospel to the world in Jesus' name. And so as the worship group come forward, I want to take a moment. We sang that chorus earlier. I've decided to follow Jesus. I don't know if you ever heard the, the origins of that powerful hymn. It's a Christian hymn all of us are familiar with. I've decided to follow Jesus. It actually originated in India. And it's based on the last dying words of an Indian man in Garo, Assam, 150 years ago. Missionaries went to this part of India with the gospel. It was a region known as Assam and had hundreds of aggressive headhunting tribes. I'm sure it was difficult ground, but these missionaries converted a man and his family. And this man began to share his faith and other people were responding. The village chief was so irate, he gathered the man and his family and he demanded that they deny Christ or face immediate execution. And the man simply responded by saying, I've, de I've decided to follow Jesus. And right before his eyes, his two little boys were killed. And as his boys lay dying on the ground before him, the chief warned him. And he said, you have lost your two sons. If you don't deny Christ, you will lose your wife as well. And he simply responded, don't none go with me. Still I will follow. And right before him, they murdered his wife. And one last time, the, the chief said to him, I'll give you one last chance to deny Christ. Deny your faith and live. The man simply said, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. And he was killed. But an amazing thing happened. After they died, a miracle happened because the chief who had ordered the killings was moved by the faith of this man. And he asked, he said, why would this man, his wife and his two children die for a man who lived in a faraway land on another continent some 2,000 years ago? There must be some remarkable power behind this family's faith. And I too want to taste that faith. And he cried out with a loud voice, I too, uh, I too belong to Jesus Christ. And with that, the whole village received Jesus as their Savior. And that's where we got that. And that's where we got that song. I have decided to follow Jesus. Jesus.